It is Tuesday, April 24th, 2018. My name is Ashton Ellett, here with another installment of the Two-Party Georgia Oral History Project, sponsored by the Richard B. Russell Library at the University of Georgia. Joining me today is Chairman of the Georgia Republican Party, Mr. John Watson. Uh, Mr. Watson is currently the Chairman of the Georgia Republican Party. He is also the founder and partner of Massey, Watson & Hembree, an all-purpose consulting and governmental affairs firm. He also served in a host of positions in politics and government, including general consultant to Sonny Perdue's 2002 gubernatorial campaign, and subsequently as chief of staff in Governor Perdue's first administration. He has also sat on the boards of several state and local organizations, including the Georgia World Congress Center, the Georgia Lottery Corporation, and the Georgia Chamber of Commerce, as well as the Metro Atlanta Chamber of Commerce. Thank you very much, Mr. Watson, for taking some time this morning. Thank you, Ashton. Please call me John. John taking some time in this busy election primary season. Um, I was wondering if we could begin uh, just by telling me a little bit about your, your childhood, your upbringing. Sure. Yeah. Uh, Ashton, I grew up in Centerville, Virginia, uh, which is uh, the western extreme edge of Fairfax County, Virginia. Uh, I'm a product of uh, Chantilly High School, public education. Uh, Mom was a teacher, Dad was a principal. Um, and. Uh, had the opportunity uh, to go to Wake Forest University and graduated from Wake Forest with a degree in politics. They didn't call it political science. It was more okay, the, I was, the I was wondering. philosophical study of, uh, of, of politics. Plato's Republic. That, that's, that's, that's exactly right. That's exactly right. So uh, back when um, not so smart people could get into Wake Forest, I did. <laughs> and uh, I'm glad not to have to make application these days. Um, I moved in the... Uh, summer of 1993 to uh, Atlanta at that point in time. I had, um, had, uh, had partaken uh, after Wake, uh, went home for a little bit in the, the baby recession that was that era and uh, thought perhaps that I would study for the LSAT and go to law school, um, but I'm not much of a test taker and so <laughs> uh, that LSAT plan kind of went by the wayside. But politics had uh, always been a heavy interest of mine. Uh, I um, remember driving gu a gubernatorial candidate as an intern uh, in a Virginia gubernatorial election. Uh, my family, um, extended family, uh, aunts, uncles, cousins, very much involved in politics. And to be honest with you, um, I, I think a lot of it just simply had to do with the fact that growing up in, in and around Washington, D.C., uh, back when uh, we all took a hard copy newspaper, and that hard copy <laughs> newspaper was the Washington Post, uh, it was difficult, regardless of one's perspective, to not kind of be involved or at least interested in and aware of, of politics. And so um, um, it's always been a, been a, a part of, of what has drawn me to um, the greatness that is our, uh, our, 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 our democracy and our, our, um, our government. and. Um, are things that are right about this country and also some of those things that are wrong about the country, but it's a work in progress. So I moved here summer of 1993 and uh, began a, a climb of campaigns and elections and um, very, very fortunate. I, I um, met my wife while working at the Georgia Republican Party and so it remains and is a family affair. And, uh, <laughs> Uh, I'll, I'll answer any other details on sure, that front, sure. but that was the quick background. <laughs> right. Well, I was wondering you know, what brought you down to Georgia. You know, you're a Virginia yep. guy, yep. North Carolina, yep. you know, Wake yep. County for, yep. for school. Yep. Yep. Why Georgia? It was really simple. Um, two, two situations. Um, there were, uh, at the, in that era, 1993, there were two meccas largely for uh, recent college graduates. One was Charlotte and one was Atlanta. Uh, and um, I, made, uh, I made two road trips and uh, visited with friends and uh, fraternity brothers and, and uh, relationships that I had with both. And candidly, Atlanta was better. <laughs> uh, and uh, on top of that, um, I also had the beginnings of a network in Georgia that I could uh, utilize. Uh, my first cousin um, was hired uh, in, um, in intergovernmental affairs at the Department of Housing and Urban Development um, under Secretary Jack Kemp. And his boss, and who hired him, was Rusty Paul. Yep. 
And so uh, my cousin Paul was able to make a call to his old boss, Rusty, who had uh, left D.C. Uh, right. in the aftermath of the, uh, the Bush presidency. And so I had uh, the beginnings of, of uh, at least a person I could call and begin the network. Sure. And, and of course, 1993, 1994 is an auspicious time to, 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 to know Rusty Paul because yep. he was chairman yep. of, of the Georgia Republican Party. He was. So he brought you on board. Yep. So yep. What, was the, what was your first position? Here in the party. I had uh, my I had I had recently uh, left as the uh, district representative for Congressman Bob Barr. I was on Bob's campaign uh, as the finance director, and then was the district representative, uh, and then Rusty was elected. And uh, as uh, as most folks in politics know, um, you start with how you're going to raise money. And uh, Rusty sought me out. Some things don't change. Some things do not change. And so uh, I had a good background uh, in, in, in raising of money. Rusty and I knew each other. And as he was assembling his team, um, I think I remember this right, I think I was the first person that he hired as the finance director at the party at that point in time. And that would have been in uh, 90, 90, late 95. Five. Mid-95, I guess he was elected in spring of 95, yeah. and so I came on board at that point in time. The Rusty Paul versus Don Balfour, I think, was the... There were three or four There were three folks. or four. Yeah, there was uh, Mike Sullivan, uh, Rockdale right. County, um, and, um, and Rusty and, and, and Don. Yes, yeah. sir. Yeah, yeah. So tell me about, yeah, this is 95, so this is post... Republican Revolution, Gingrich Revolution, which you were a part of, yep. helping Congressman yep. Barr defeat yep. Yep. Fr friend of the program, friend yep. of everybody, Buddy yep. Darden, and, and, and a friend of mine. Right. <laughs> I don't. I don't know anybody who. I don't know. I, Buddy's one of those people who who doesn't have enemies. He's mm. friends with everybody. That's exactly right. Um, what was it like trying to to work in and build the party, um, the party organization after some you know, top you know top down success? Uh, at the congressional level, and then obviously with Senator Coverdell in yeah. office, I, it was Ashton. It was a it was a great era uh, in the Republican Party for this reason. My memories of that um, uh, are one of of great partnership uh, at the uh, local political level, the grassroots level. Um, great partnership among those that were in elective office. The, 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 the necessities of a party in the minority require a level of, um, of partnership and um, uh, togetherness uh, because you have a common need. Um, you're not at all components concerned about tactical policy positions. Right. You're concerned with how do we take the hill? And because of that, that created, again, a high degree of camaraderie and a spirit of joint mission uh, at, all, at all facets. Now, uh, obviously, no, that's not every single person in the process. <laughs> sure, sure. However, my memories are of, of, of many members uh, who were just simply active in the Republican Party uh, that have gone on to be members of Congress, um, active members of the party that have gone on to be leaders in our General Assembly, mm -hmm. um, active members of, of the business community that have gone on to have, again, um, thriving, continued thriving businesses. But my memory is one of, again, great, uh, great partnership because of a common goal and a common need of which was to take what was going on at the federal level. Uh, uh, i.e. winning federal elections right. uh, and, and, and motivating uh, a, a Democratic, an identified Democrat who was voting as a Republican federally and to convince them that it was really time and it was okay to go ahead and pull the trigger on behalf of a Republican candidate at the state level. And that's what we were focused on. What, was it difficult, because we've identified between 92 and 94, Georgia sends seven, including Speaker Gingrich, seven Republicans to Congress, but down to the General Assembly and the Governor's Mansion, it's still a, a, a Democratic lock. Absolutely. What, 
was it more important in terms of a party building apparatus to make gains at the state level in terms of money, recruitment, uh, those sort of organizational um, and tactical? Uh, well, we, we had, the answer is yes. I mean, we, we, had, we were great beneficiaries in terms of, um, of, of, of available resources and networks. When you, have, uh, when you have the speaker in your home state, uh, at that point in time, Congressman John Linder was a very active participant, not only in the sure. Congress, but also in making certain and helping what was going on in Georgia at that point in time at the party level. Um, uh, obviously, uh, Bob Barr was a part of that process. I mean, there were any number of folks that were indeed, again, elected federally, but still had an eye toward home. Right. And, 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 and there's a degree of self-preservation involved in that because you had a Democratic State General Assembly who's still in charge of redistricting. Oh, yeah. And so if you're a member of Congress, <laughs> no matter how concerned you are and how participatory you are at the federal level, at the end of the day, if the other team is controlling your destiny in terms of the shape of your district, you're still going to take a heavy, <laughs> have a heavy, uh, heavy desire to be involved and see change there. And, and I mean, I, I would point out that, that people like Bob Barr, who had been chairman of, at the county level, That's correct. John Linder had been very close with, with Paul Coverdell That's and right. sort of that That's right. grassroots party Absolutely. building. Jumping ahead, is that something that you, you with, just, with, you know, Republican majorities now, you know, in, in both houses, right. is that still that knowledge that, that you know, you know, the, 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 the fact that the Republican Party hasn't always been mm -hmm. this strong, this powerful. Mm -hmm. um, is that lost on newer members, younger members of what it took to get here? I, I think that for, the, for your party. The, and, and, and before I answer that question, I also do want to make a great statement about um, the late Senator Coverdale. Obviously, as a chairman of the Georgia Republican Party, I mean, he was a, he was a glue um, that um, and a binding agent that was really critical as as we were all tr working together mm -hmm. and, uh, and and really great credit need be given um, uh, to um, Senator Mattingly, Senator Coverdale, uh, Bo Calloway again any Bo number Calloway, of, of right. frontier uh, frontiersmen um, in the process. To answer your question, Ashton. Um, it is uh, quietly in the halls of of the of the Capitol, or more likely in closed rooms. Um, there certainly is a um, a, a reminiscing um, around many of us that consider ourselves to quote have been there, um, and a a a wish that all had um, um, had that experience or knowledge base. Um, it's impossible to do that, um, sure. but nonetheless, are there, are there those, is that, does that conversation transpire? Certainly. Um, but the reality is, is that um, the majority party is always going to be um, more capable of recruiting new adherents um, and, 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 and new members to the party, whether they trans worked in the 90s like I did or worked in the 60s like <laughs> others did. Um, Everything changes and faces come and go mm -hmm. and newness and new perspectives and new ideas are healthy to the environment. But yeah, there's a lot of conversation <laughs> about, boy, I wish, I, I wish everyone had a perspective as to how difficult this was to get here right. and how we all need to continue to work together to maintain it for the betterment of Georgia. You know, speaking of getting there, uh, you were chairman for a time of the Georgia Republican Party Foundation, yes. which is sort of the the granddaddy of sure. fundraising sure. Know, arms of the party. How, how did that, how did the foundation and, and you try to pitch yourselves as a minority party in Georgia, right. uh, in a state with a very strong Democratic governor? Sure. Speaker Murphy was still in charge. Sure. How did you, what was your sales pitch to yeah. get people to believe? I was, I was fortunate to have that role. Uh, Chairman Ralph Reed um, um, was kind enough to ask me to play that role. At that point in our fundraising, Ashton, um, back up, there are, there are really two uh, veins of givers uh, in a political environment. There are philosophical givers, and then there are transactional givers. 
um, and a, a philosophical giver is just that, one that is more likely to give in support of a, uh, a platform or a party writ large. Right. And then there are, again, transactional givers that um, uh, I would say are more aligned with where the levers of power exist and who controls those levers. When I was raising money at the foundation level and really prior to that as, a, as, as the finance director here, our givers uh, were, were philosophical in nature. Uh, they were adherents to what was going on under under President Reagan's leadership. Right. Uh, they were adherents to the the, the, the economic policies of, of President Reagan, and by extension of that, President Bush, and the contract with America, the components of what the speaker had had, had promoted and what we were trying to accomplish. And so, what we focused on were those that uh, those givers that were aligned with those at a philosophical level. And then we were able to utilize those resources to then transmit and work on state races and to use many of those same principles in our campaigning, but again, making the jump from a federal election to a state election. Right. So did you find that that small do dollar donors and large dollar donors uh, were among both philosophical and transactional, or were, were, were small dollar donors tended to be the I, yeah, there's no question. A, 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 a quote, small dollar donor is certainly more likely to be driven by philosophy. Right. Um, and um, because there's not an expectation that they're, quote, handing the check to someone <laughs> and, and looking them in the eye and, 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 and hoping that that person remembers them. Um, this is someone that, um, and God bless each and every one, the reality is is that these are men and women um, who are living their lives and doing the best they can on behalf of their, their families, um, and they're willing to make a, a small investment um, behind the party that they think hel helps them and helps their family best succeed. Right. So again, much more philosophical in nature, yes. So before you were at the foundation, your first statewide campaign mm -hmm. was the Mike Bowers That's campaign for, yep. for governor. Yep, campaign manager for Mike Bowers. So did you come in, when did you come into that, um, that campaign? Uh, from, the very, from the very beginning? Very beginning, yep, yep. Um, anybody who's, who's, who's read or studied about Georgia politics, I mean, this is a very famous campaign because mm -hmm. of, mm -hmm. he, he come, Attorney General Bowers comes in as the front runner. Mm -hmm. There are some revelations which, which the mm -hmm. Attorney General himself made public. Mm -hmm. You stayed on the campaign, mm -hmm. and how how were you able to to um, you know, stay on the campaign and still make it competitive in what was admittedly a, a difficult circumstances? Yeah, fair enough. Yeah, fair look, enough. I mean, um, I didn't want to tiptoe around. No, it too, no, 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 no. Much, no look, but, I mean, first of all. Um, uh, Mike, uh, Mike, and and his wife Betty Rose are are um, still remain family to my wife Kimberly and I and our children. Um, Mike, uh, I I believe that if you hang around in politics long enough, the likelihood is that you work for someone that could be president of the United States um, in a different circumstance, without the issues that transpired on a personal level with Mike. Mike was a presidential candidate. Wow. The, the level of intellect, um, experience, mm -hmm. I mean, you have West Point, you've got uh, master's, uh, MBA, um, attorney general, um, a level of personal charisma that, 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 is, that is still very much out front. Um, Mike was the full deal, real deal. Um, and we, he was to be the first Republican governor, without a shadow of doubt. Um, that said, obviously, that uh, Mike made, made, made some pretty significant mistakes. And uh, I like to say in this process that, uh, um, you know, um, the good Lord um, uh, made Mike appropriately pay a penalty for what transpired. What he was able to withstand and keep intact was his family but he was going to lose his political future. And um, that's what happens. Sure. <laughs> that's sure. what happens in the process. But I would, to specifically answer your question, I believed in Mike. Um, I believe that he was the right person. 
um, there were any number of people that also agree with that. We did it and we stayed in it uh, and lived out of sheer grit um, as, 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 as the examples of, of leading by Mike and Betty Rose and the family at that point in time. Um, and so again, we just, we just ground it out to the best we could. 2000, and of course, Guy Milner, who was running yep. statewide for, for yep. a third time, yep. um, who, who was gracious enough to sit down for an yep. interview, yep. Um, carried a lot of water for the party mm -hmm. statewide in the 90s, but was unsuccessful. Um, but for 30,000 votes would have been the first Republican governor in, exactly in, right. in 1994. That's exactly right. Um, what would, let's play a little game <laughs> called what if. What if Guy Milner had been elected governor in 1994, what would that have meant for the Republican Party organization hmm. to have a governor in 94 or yeah. 95, I yeah. suppose? Yeah, no, I mean, uh, it, 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 it would have been, um, it would have been um, uh, spectacular. I mean, obviously you can't, you can't say uh, anything other than winning at that stage of the process. Um, you know, Guy, um, uh, perhaps in many ways, was, was a man before his time in terms of the businessman outsider. Um, a guy really fit a, a mold that, that did not see great uh, support from the electorate until 20-some right. years in, into the sure. future. Sure. And so again, as, as a man really uh, ahead of his time in terms of his offering to the marketplace, <laughs> um, it really was more a game at that point in time of what were your electoral credentials and your background as an elected official. And that's, that's not what Guy's background was. Uh, would it, what it would have meant to the party uh, would have been, um, I, I think we would have more rapidly taken control of the General Assembly. Um, certainly the, uh, the Speaker um, Murphy at that point in time was, was still um, in his, um, in, in, in uh, a, a very powerful mode, and so there would have been, I think, rather epic battles uh, between <laughs> uh, Speaker Murphy and, um, and Guy, but nonetheless, uh, it certainly would have accelerated what transpired later under Governor Perdue. So, fast forwarding to 2002, um, you worked for a time with Bill Byrne, who was mm -hmm. uh, Cobb County Commission Chair. Mm -hmm. How did you get, um, was that because of his proximity to Cobb County and you had worked in Cobb County with, uh, with Congressman Barr? Um, Bill and uh, his wife, Babe, uh, are um, in particular, Babe, um, are personal family friends. Uh, my father-in-law uh, was raised by the Adkins family and Babe is a Adkins. And so, um, and steep, deep knowledge and deep relationships in Cobb County, and I got to know Bill not just through that environment, family environment, but also through my efforts with with uh, with Bob. And so, um, um, we that that is indeed where I started that cycle. At yes, sir. So in two thousand two, you've got Bill Byrne from Cobb County, mm -hmm. which had been the epicenter mm -hmm. of, of Republican Party growth in the eighties and early nineties. Mm -hmm. yep. Um, Linda Shrinko from Columbia mm -hmm. County, so another suburban county, and then this former Democrat mm -hmm. turned Republican state senator from Bonaire, mm -hmm. Georgia, down mm -hmm. in Sam Nunn, Larry Walker yep. country. Talk to me about the dynamics of, of that primary campaign and why you think it, it turned out the way it turned out. Uh, Sonny Perdue um, was able to... Um, Break the break the DNA, um, and what I mean by that is, he his his relationships, his knowledge, his geographic location uh, was able to cut through and convince again that same federal voter right to do differently in the Republican primary process. Um, Bill, as you said, was indeed in, in Cobb County. Um, uh, Linda from Augusta, Columbia, Richmond area. Um, but what Sonny was able to do um, was to leverage the caucuses, or the, the House and the Senate caucuses um, were, were um, accentuators of the campaign at that point in time. And so because of that network at the General Assembly level, 
Um, he had the capacity to plug in into many communities across the state. Um, at that point in time, um, it, it, it was apparent that um, the issues of, the, of, of that time with Governor Barnes, whether it be the teacher pay raises, whether it be the King Roy mantra, whether it be the flag discussion, there are any number of things that just candidly Sonny was more adept at in terms of, and, and we were able to uh, accentuate and, and take to our advantage. Right. I don't think anyone, uh, I would not, I did not anticipate that we would win that primary without a runoff. Um, but um, um, then Sonny, <laughs> not secretary and not governor, um, had a plane, was everywhere, could be everywhere, uh, and we had a, uh, a cadre of very hungry young operatives that were willing to do whatever it took to get elected, and, uh, and, and Sonny was equally as so. So um, uh, we just we hustled like crazy, and principally he hustled like crazy, and, um, and good things happen when you do that. Was it important, it, looking ahead to the general election, was it important for the Republican Party to have a face and a voice that wasn't Metro Atlanta. I think that uh, I, I think that the, an the answer is yes. I think that the um, Sonny was able to give to be comfortable to those in North, Middle, and South Georgia who were philosophically aligned with Republican candidates, mm -hmm. but had a degree of doubt as to do they get me and do they get the quote other Georgia. There has always been and there always remains a doubt in those communities as sure. to whether Atlanta <laughs> really has their interests or understands their needs. And so Sonny was able to bridge those divides by um, being someone that Republicans could be supportive of in the metro community, but nonetheless was seen as a trustworthy translator for those communities other than Atlanta. Did the general election surprise you that, that Sonny Perdue defeated Roy Barnes? Sonny and I, uh, all the data suggested no. Um, I can remember um, a, um, a, a, a conversation that I had uh, with, with the, the then candidate, whereby in the closing days of the campaign, um, we had a conversation that was, something's going on. The data says X, but we are feeling gutturally Y. And campaigns, uh, when you're in the middle of them, obviously it, it somewhat is easy to think, my goodness, everyone's telling me we're doing great, so surely we are, <laughs> okay? <laughs> right. And, and that happens. But there was a degree of energy, uh, a degree of, of work, a degree of just something going on in the environment. And we talked about that, and we talked about, okay, what are our next steps if this actually happens? And we did have that prior to, uh, and within days, okay? I'm sure. not talking like we planned the transition 30 days out or anything even Measure, close to Measuring that. the drapes. Yeah, there, there was none of that. But there certainly was a feeling that what we were seeing in the public polls was not an adequate uh, or an accurate depiction of what we felt was going to happen on Election Day. Um, can I tell you in my heart of hearts that on Election Day, I, I knew we were going to win <laughs> or anything along those lines? Absolutely not. But at the end of the day, nor was I surprised by what happened. How much, I don't know if coordination is the right word, or cooperation might be a better word, was there with Saxby Chambliss's Senate campaign and also President George W. Bush, mm -hmm. his White House was very active in the 2002 mm -hmm. midterms. How much cooperation was there with the other camp, other major statewide campaign, and then also with with the the Bush Rove White House? Uh, th there was there was cooperation. Um, however, um, we had to prove that we were in the game, 
if you're the President of the United States, ultimately what you care about is a man or woman that can vote for your agenda in the United States Senate. Right. A governor is a wonderful thing to have, <laughs> but it is not necessarily a must. It's second fiddle. It is second fiddle. And so um, we, I can remember a, a very specific uh, meeting at the RNC, uh, whereby we, uh, we, we, uh, we went to the RNC and, and uh, had to make a presentation associated with our viability because at that point in time, what was being viewed as our viability was through the lens of public polling. Uh, and, and, and that polling was not uh, indicative of somebody that was about to win. Right. And so um, certainly there was um, uh, communication, there was uh, cooperation, but we had to earn and promote and push that cooperation. And I no, out of no disrespect to anybody involved, again, if, if, I'm, if I'm at the RNC level, the, for, the fortress is maintaining the United States Senator who's going to vote for me at, at that point in time. But, um, you know, look, we got the... Uh, we got the shot of uh, Sonny running on, on Air Force One. Right. Um, we got the shot needed, of which was he with the president at that point in time. Um, we immediately got that up on television. And so at the end of the day, regardless of how we got there, um, we got it done. And that was in partnership with Saxby, with the delegation, with the president, with Carl, everybody at that point in time. So Sonny wins on election night. Yep. So does Saxby Chambliss, Senator Chambliss. What's the next step for John Watson, knowing that the guy you just worked for is going to be the governor of Georgia? Uh, at that point in time, we did start trying to figure out, okay, good gracious, what comes next? <laughs> what, what do we have to do? Um, and uh, uh, just being very, very tactical, I can, remember, I can remember looking at office space for transition the very next day. Um, and a whole lot of other people were involved in this process, but we knew we had to quickly stand up an environment whereby we could function separate of a campaign uh, and, and begin to um, organize ourselves to be prepared to govern. Um, and so that was the very first and paramount thing on our minds was trying to figure that out. We all collectively under the then governor-elect's leadership uh, began to, to put together an organization. Mm -hmm. um, I, I guess, I don't know if we ever gave titles, but uh, I guess you could, I was more, uh, essentially like executive director of the transition. Uh, Carl Swearingen was the chair and, and, and a good and dear friend. And so um, we, we cobbled together um, those components of the campaign that were going to be um, uh, pulled into the transition environment. Uh, when you go into those situations, fundraising goes over to the inaugural um, and the uh, policy folks from the campaign level and the political components come into the more official transition environment to determine, okay, how are we going to staff this thing up? Mm -hmm. uh, what roles are there going to be? Uh, there was a heavy discussion at the very early stages of the campaign as to um, what, who the, was there to be a speaker's race? Could there be someone challenged? Um, could there be a coalition, in essence, formed uh, to challenge Speaker Murphy? Um, we were um, um, seeking possible switchers in the Senate right. uh, to make certain that we, we could take the Senate. Thankfully, we did without an actual election cycle. Uh, there, of course, Speaker Murphy got beat by uh, Bill Heath. But later, the, in the direct after, there was a conversation in the, the, that we, uh, we, we had hoped that perhaps we could form a coalition of Democrats and Republicans to take out Speaker Murphy in advance of that later election when Bill Heath beat him at his district level. Um, we were not able to achieve that success to take the House in, in, 2000, in essentially January of 2003. Um, we did get the switchers in the Senate, however, right. and then we're able to get the, uh, the House uh, two years later. So you succeeded Eric Tannenblatt mm -hmm. as chief of staff mm -hmm. in, I think it was a, about a year or so into yeah, the... Yeah, came in at the, at the end of, yes. So tell, tell me about the, 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 the Leo McGarry you know, chief of staff position in, in the governor's mansion. What, what's, a day, what's an average day look like for a chief of staff in <laughs> the, the governor's mansion? The, the uh, average day um, is, is as thrilling a job as one could have. Um, and 
you're you're involved in um, in decisions both broad and very granular. <laughs> um, you're dealing with situations whereby um, you have to be concerned about the governor's schedule, um, how he or she moves, uh, along with budget discussions, along with uh, legislative uh, initiatives, all the while hoping that there's not a hurricane forming out <laughs> over the coast or a hurricane in this instance that we had to deal with Katrina um, out, to our, out to our west. And so I do believe um, it's probably the most thrilling job that I will ever have. Um, you're, you go through a daily triage of essentially dealing with those things that are on fire um, and having to deal with versus, versus those things that may turn on fire or something that you just need to set aside and let it soak for a little while. Right. And so there's a constant triaging of those items to determine where they fall in the mix. Uh, and then all the while, ultimately, you're, you're hoping to promote um, that what you ran on and is now interpreted into governing. Right such that you then have the opportunity to make people's lives better. I mean, that's ultimately what the process is about. Um, I reflect back on, on those days as being most proud, very candidly, of what Georgia under Governor Purdue's leadership did during Katrina. Um, obviously, um, we had a lot to do in the budgeting process associated with precipitous downfalls in, in, in a couple of situations right. in, in revenue, but at the end of the day, uh, it, it, it ultimately is about men and women, the citizens of Georgia, who by and large on a daily basis don't care what state government is doing, don't want to be bothered by state government. But what they do want to know is that at that point in time the government is needed, they can do its job. Right. And that's the type of thing that a, that a chief of staff has to worry about and care about um, when you're in the job. So you stayed for the remainder of the first term that's through, through the election, that's the correct. re-elect that's correct. In, in, in 06. That's correct. But decided to step away. Yep. It, it, is it because is it because this is a twelve to fourteen hour a day job job yeah, being I, gatekeeper for I, the governor? I had a um, my uh, my uh, Kimberly and I's um, second daughter Avery was born in the transition, so we had a twenty two month old and an infant um, in the in the transition environment. Um, Makes sense already. Yeah, and so thankfully. Um, um, uh, we agreed, uh, and the governor and I agreed that that I I was signing up for a the balance of the first term commitment. But to do the job right, um, it is a all consuming um, deal. And when you have young kids, especially young kids, who don't know whether dad was home or not, <laughs> to be honest with you, um, it was tolerable. Um, I have extreme uh, respect for my good friend Chris Riley in terms of his capacity to have done this for eight years. Right. Um, but uh, each and every governor and chief of staff has, has a different and unique uh, environment. The governor, Purdue, and I um, uh, remain close um, and worked very, very um, successfully together. But I was, it was time for me to go in terms of my capacity to, uh, to put into the job what I felt was necessary because I never wanted, what I found at the end of the day, and I'll end with this, what I found at the end of the day, many times a chief of staff um, has to have the capacity to play mad. Um, what I found at the end of the process was I was mad. Oh. And I didn't like that. I was getting, I was too frequently actually mad at things and people versus playing my role. And I said, you know what? <laughs> It's it's time to give some this to somebody else for for a try. So, so playing bad cop and being the bad cop are two different things. <laughs> That's exactly right. So you you went back into I assume your your consultancy and and, and everything. Did did you find what was the difference? You, you were coming out with the Republicans in in Georgia in control of the governor's mansion, both houses, and you're you're going back you know, to to your firm. How has the environment changed for a Republican consultant in, well, in this new I actually, Georgia? I actually took a fairly lengthy sojourn into commercial real estate. Okay. I did not immediately go back into government. Um, honestly, I did not want to immediately go back, excuse me, go back into the consulting world because um, by nature, um, 
I, and this may sound peculiar for a lobbyist, um, <laughs> I don't, it's not natural for me to be solicitous of, of my friends. Sure. And um, I, uh, I, I still am, am very prideful in when I do advocate, um, I do so uh, with a perspective as to how would this be viewed and heard were I still chief of staff? Right. And ultimately, can I make an argument that what I'm, I'm advocating for is something that I would ultimately view as good for Georgia and good for my family? And so, um, again, I, I, I felt a need to take a break um, and uh, went into commercial real estate. The uh, stress-free the, world. The stress of, free, uh, <laughs> particularly in 2007. Yeah, and I remember. <laughs> yeah, so um, I, my, I tell, market, uh, tell people my market timing in real estate is impeccable. And when you see me get into real estate, run for the, run, run for the do- exit because it's not a good thing. But ultimately, I did have a good break from it. Uh, but what it came down to was that, uh, um, um, you know, the good Lord says to all of us, I think, ultimately, uh, it just takes us all longer, perhaps, than others to realize, hey, this is, the, this is the place you're supposed to be in and the types of career you're supposed to have. And so um, I was able to, uh, to reach, that, uh, reach that spot um, and, and did indeed rejoin my firm. Um, and, uh, and look, I mean, it, it, for, for a government affairs firm, uh, mind you, we established as a bipartisan firm. Right. Um, very, Lewis Massey. Lewis very purposefully recruited uh, Lewis to be uh, a partner because I had no idea as to how quickly the transition would actually transpire to all Republican. Right. Um, and so um, when coming back into the firm, um, um, I, um, I was benefited and remain benefited by, I think, um, people believing that I did a pretty good job as chief um, and that um, I'm somebody that, again, as I made reference to you, um, fundamentally is, is, is willing and, and prepared to do a job on behalf of my clients, but not to the detriment of the state of Georgia. And so, um, you know, that's, that's been important. Um, obviously, um, I've grown up with a lot of the people that are in this process sure. of, of power. Um, I have been a, a, I'm now a peer, um, the Chris Cars of the world and many's of the, many people in the General Assembly, um, I'm either a peer in age or older than. <laughs> and so it's, it's a fascinating process and, and a, lot, a, lot of, uh, a, lot of, a lot of fun to be candid with you to see uh, the, the prosperity of the party and the prosperity of the state at the same time. Now, did you play a role in, in Governor Deal's Campaign. I was. Uh, I, I did. I did. Uh, after Governor uh, Deal uh, secured the nomination, um, I was very fortunate to be asked um, by um, uh, Governor Deal and Chris to join a, uh, a cooperative effort that involved some dollars that were available through um, Governor Purdue's um, yet unspent reelection dollars and. Given our knowledge of the party and given my knowledge right. of the party process, was able to partner at that point in time and participate in that, and then later was able uh, and very honored to be asked to be on the transition. So, um, was it easier the second time the transition? It was. <laughs> it was. We were uh, we were able to utilize um, the, the, the the state government had changed out at that point in time, right? And so, what I like to say is that you know, Governor Governor Purdue dealt with a hostile takeover environment. Um, uh, Governor Deal, in a transition environment, got the deal, uh, w- participated in a merger. Right. And those are fundamentally different <laughs> situations. And so um, it was a much more collegial, as you can imagine, and a much more um, smooth transition, as you would expect, in, 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 and of course was right. in that situation. So I think, I, I, Ashton, I, I may be wrong, but I I think I'm, I'm, I'm one of the few people that's actually participated in the only two gubernatorial transitions that, that have actually been and helped lead in that process, something I'm very proud of. Right, right. So you came back in, into the, the lobbying world and everything like that, and then David Perdue mm-hmm. runs a campaign. And, of course, everybody knew he was cousin of, of mm-hmm. Sonny Perdue. yet he was still able to market himself as some, that sort of that outsider business. Mm-hmm. Go back to Guy Milner, for sure. example. Sure. Um, sure. A similar pitch. Sure. Uh, you know, how almost twenty years later. Sure, that's a, right. 
as you said. Why do you think that was successful um, in that in that Republican primary mm -hmm. where you had Jack Kingston, the, the Paul Brown, uh, Phil Gingry, and then Karen Handel, I yep. believe, yep. was was the other yep. major candidate. Yep. Why do you, why do you think David Perdue struck a chord with Re the Republican electorate? I think at that point in time. Um, um, we were reaching the zenith of the desire and thirst for the, quote, outsider. Um, politics is always, always about timing. Um, and so you had, uh, you had a candidate uh, who had a high familiarity and name identification, last name Purdue, obviously. Uh, I think that you had um, a positive, um, positive feelings toward the name Purdue and at a uh, yet it was a, a, a branded in an outsider perspective and so David was able to take what was the credibility of Sonny mm -hmm. and the credibility of the network that was still largely in place at the operative level and also from a grassroots level was able to again springboard off of the name Purdue and the credibility that came with the name Purdue, but brand it in what was appropriate at that time, which was, again, a guy that had never been elected to office, who simply came at it from a business perspective, who simply said, I don't get why Washington's broken, and I want to know, and I'm going to go up there and be different from what it is that you have historically or classically voted for. And so uh, David fit the moment, um, and really, I, I think, was a, uh, a canary in the coal mine for President Trump. Um, certainly a different type of, of campaigning characteristic in terms of the social media, in terms of, of, of um, being uh, um, different styles, sure. okay? <laughs> sure. different, different styles. But nonetheless, uh, he, he, David, I think, spoke to uh, people that had just simply wanted to acknowledge that the damn thing was broken and the only way we get it unbroken is by trying to put different kinds of people in office. And so I, again, believe that very much that, again, while style's vastly different, that nonetheless David was a canary in the coal mine associated with the type of candidate the Republican Party and ultimately the country wanted for president. So af after that, that election, you know, you decided to take the you know, jump into the race for the glamorous position of state party chairman. Right. What compelled you to do that at that time? And this would have been twenty sixteen. Yeah. No. Uh, no, it was later than that. I mean, I we was I, it twenty early twenty seventeen? That's correct. Okay. Yep. 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 And that's yep. right because yep. it's always that's in right. the spring. Yeah. I mean, Ashton, um, I got in this race because look, there there are. In a, in a party process, there are certainly um, different opinions as to the direction of a party. Sure. Um, I am um, I'm a, I'm a conservative. Um, I believe in the absolute fundamental tenets and platform of our party in a classic Reagan mode. Um, but I also believe that in a majority governing environment, that the, the pressures associated with how one governs adequately are different than the pressures that one has when you're trying to take the majority and become the governing party. Right. Um, I believe that the, the party uh, should be an amplifier of the policies and initiatives of our elected officials. Our elected officials are the men and women that hold themselves to the ballot box and that they are the ones that are um, either affirmed or denied by the citizens of Georgia. And I believe that it is fundamentally the party's responsibility in a majority party environment to be supportive of the men and women who are elected by the citizenry of the state of Georgia and to be a, an, a, an election earring vehicle mm -hmm less so than a policy-driven vehicle. Um, now, that is not the entirety of opinion, okay? There are certainly men and women who I have great respect for at the party level, 
mm -hmm. who believe that the party absolutely should be a North Star for policy, that we then should make certain that our nominees adhere to. And that's, that, that again is just a difference in philosophy that I have about what the role of a chairman is. Right. Okay. So that, that, that I think gets us to, to my next question, which is, you know, here it is, early 2017, Republicans control governor's mansion, House, mm -hmm. Senate, every statewide mm -hmm. elected official from U.S. Mm -hmm. Senate down to labor commissioner, mm -hmm. agriculture commissioner. Yet it takes three ballots in a hotly contested chairman ra chairman's race. Um, you, um, Alex Johnson, who had mm -hmm. run previously mm -hmm. uh, against your your predecessor, mm -hmm. um, I guess it gets to the the, the question of you know, are, is that indicative of a larger split or division within the party, as opposed to just this crops up every two years at a chairman's race. Is that is this an no, no, ongoing I, I, I divide? Think it, no, I think it absolutely is. I think that it, it, it is the remaining vestiges of, of uh, the discussion begun by the Tea Party, of which um, I think is, and, and, and I, the, the Tea Party, um, um, the promotion, the frustration associated with the Tea Party, the frustration of what had been in, in, in some ways continues in terms of spending. I mean. Those are important issues, and I've I've got no um, I've got no no issues there. But there 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 still remains a, a split. Um, there are um, there are members of our party um, who struggle to see that there is a difference in some of our elected officials between R and D. Okay, um, and there are struggles that will be ongoing associated with that. Right. Um, um, what, what I try to communicate is that, that we ought look at a framework of where our state is going and where our, our, our country is going. And if, if, if in a majority of situations you identify with one party over the other, then the reality is, in my situation, obviously that's a Republican. Do I agree with every Republican elected official in every situation? No. But I also believe that as a party leader, I have to give our elected officials the capacity to govern and that we as party activists need give our elected officials a capacity to govern. What I mean by that is this, there are tough decisions that need be made based upon the structure of our government. Right. And that is not always adequately communicated by our elected officials. The simplicity of why did one vote on this is much different than saying I voted on this because of something that was going to happen in the Senate based upon filibuster rules or based upon uh, cloture rules, right. and things that are just impossible to adequately communicate when all you see is something that just makes you mad. Right. I voted against it so I could bring it up later. That, that, that yeah. does, or, that, exactly. Or doesn't or, or always from a, translate. Or from, or from a, a perspective of, 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 an, of a, uh, a, a Republican activist, again, of which sure. I am one. You say, wait a minute, you were here when you were campaigning and said X, mm -hmm. yet something has transpired over here in, in a governing environment. Right. We've got to do collectively a better job of narrowing that communication divide because in that divide becomes strife sure. and becomes animosity and becomes a Republican fighting against Republican. And that is that void, that chasm is something that I'm trying to make certain that we at least understand each other's perspectives while in a governing environment. Sure. D do you think your experience uh, coming up through the party as, a, as an activist within the party organization when you were trying to take 
control of government as that sort of minority voice, sure. the, 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 the loyal opposition party, sure. um, and now as chairman of the party of the governing majority party. Sure. Do you think that, that has, has sort of given you that perspective? I, I think, or is that something no, that has I, been No, a, I think unquestionably. I mean, when, when, when I began my career, all Republicans didn't agree with each other. Oh, that's uh, true. However, we agreed on one paramount thing. That was that, how do we get to be the majority party? Right. And in that environment, you have to look past some tactical differences to try to achieve a greater strategic outcome. Right. When you're in the majority party, the differences are more accentuated because the person that wins, so to speak, rules, or that policy has the capacity of actually being implemented. And so in a minority party process, one might say, yeah, I'm just not going to deal with that difference because right. there's not a chance that it's going to get into policy. Okay? Mm -hmm. Majority party, when there are policy differences that ultimately can result in law being signed in, excuse me, legislation that's signed into law and implemented by the executive, right. well then those differences are going to come about. Right. And I think that yes, undoubtedly, having been a minority member of party and someone that has helped govern, I think I, I do have a, certainly a perspective of both camps that I think, I hope, is healthy in the dialogue. When, when, when the, the goal is winning power, you know, if it's some, a Brookhaven Republican and some Republican from Hay Hira or Tai sure. you know, Tai down in South Georgia, sure. it, the goal is winning elections. Sure. But the policies that, that those electorates will support. Sure. Is that where the tension comes with a geographic difference, ideological difference, yeah, policy I, I, prescriptions, I, I think things there's, of that I, nature? I think there's no question to that. I mean, I think there is no question that one's community um, certainly shapes uh, one, and uh, I think that there are differences in Republicans along the ideological spectrum that is primarily driven appropriately by what those communities want. Sure. Um, and no elected official can withstand um, serially being against the interest of their community. <laughs> and that's not how it, you, it even got Speaker Murphy. It, 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 it even ultimately got Speaker Murphy. And so uh, all elected officials um, are ultimately in, in our form of government to be a degree of a mirror of their community but then also given the trust of their community to have a level of discernment and wisdom to make tough decisions. Right. Um, and those are different, even in our party, from community to community. And that's okay. It does, however, require greater work sure. and greater communication to try to make certain that we hold, hold it together. Um, and that is not always a tough, uh, not always an easy situation. I guess that's a, that's a good segue to, to my next question, which is Republicans have been in charge now for 15-ish years, going on 15 years. Why have they been able to stay the majority party and what is the greatest danger to their majority status or maintaining majority status? I think that uh, I think the, the the reason why we've been able to maintain majority status is because uh, it's it's really not much rocket science to this. I think that the manner in which Sonny Perdue and Nathan Deal have led uh, is consistent with where the state of Georgia is. We are a uh, a center right state. Um, I acknowledge and understand that over the coming decades that that can change, and there's lots of of uh, parlor conversation around how rapidly that will transpire, when it transpires, and the whole nine yards. But uh, both Sonny Perdue and Nathan Deal have had to lead in a financially conservative environment, both having dealt with significant drop-offs in revenue, and have done so and led in a fashion that has not led to dramatic changes in 
service right. has not led to dramatic increases in taxes, has not led to bankruptcies associated with defaults on our debt, has maintained triple, triple, triple bond rating. As a former Illinois resident. I you got it, you got it. And at the same time, have been promotional and supportive of both socially conservative issues as well as fiscally conservative issues, yet have, again, led in a fashion that is cognizant of a growing state, now 10.3 million people, right. and that at the end of the day, only about a million or two of those on either side actually participate in the elective process. And there remains a responsibility to have an ear to and an awareness of that Georgian who doesn't participate in the primary process, but nonetheless need to be in a functioning state. Right. And I think that both men, again, suited their times, hostile takeover, friendly merger, and Governor Deal has, has been wonderfully uh, um, targeted on making certain that we, again, maintained resources mm -hmm. in, in, in our rainy day fund, but targeted like a laser on job creation and economic development. And I, I hope and believe that Governor Purdue laid a foundation of making government more business-like in nature, more decision, more data-driven in its decision-making, and that the situations the governors have compounded in, in, in a positive way on each other. Right. And what I now hope and believe must transpire that Georgia and our nominee must present what is Georgia 2.0? Where is the Republican Party taking Georgia? It's fine to say that this is what we've done. At the end of the day, a successful campaign is driven by what am I going to do for you next? Right. And we have to adequately talk about those issues. We certainly do still have issues of, of problem in our state. There's no way any society ever solves all of its right. problems. And so we have to make certain that we talk about education, we talk about health care, we talk about economic development, but we do so in a fashion that is tied to our party in terms of fundamentally believing that the citizenry is better off left to their devices than government. It's a little early, but Governor Deal is term limited. He'll leave office next January. What do you think his legacy will be? And specifically, you know, you're talking about business creation and, and things of that, that, that nature. Governor Deal's taken some steps that have led some to call him the, the Deep South's most progressive governor in terms of religious freedom, mm -hmm. uh, a very divisive issue. Mm -hmm. Guns on campus was, a, a, was and is a divis divisive issue. So I guess what I'm saying is Governor Deal has been willing to veto mm -hmm. majority legislation passed by Republicans. Uh, why, why, my question would be one, why and, and to what larger end uh, was, was Governor Deal you know, operating in, in, in those circumstances? I, I, I think that, you know, you, you have to look at, you have to look at Governor Deal's background. First as, first as a Southern Democrat. Um, and then as, 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 a, as a Republican now in long standing. And the, the governor, in my estimation, has led um, and made decisions based upon where he feels the core of Georgia is. Mm -hmm. um, it is a governor's responsibility um, in the quiet times of bill review and in the quietness of the Capitol after this, quote, proverbial circus has left town <laughs> uh, to seek counsel and um, seek wisdom associated with where is the, where is the, the quote, silent majority. Sure. And, and in his discernment, on the issues that he's decided, 
the silent majority, the working every, everyday Georgian who's not participating always at, at a granular level in politics, um, he has made decisions that he believes position Georgia most fundamentally to help that person now and their children. And, and that is um, uh, an environment that doesn't have wild swings because, and this goes back to uh, something Governor Purdue used to say, when we were being asked to take the state in one direction that was, call it dogmatically Republican. He would say, and as a pilot metaphor, <laughs> of which he is a pilot and also loves metaphors, he said, you know what? We can bank the plane gently and come in for a smooth landing, or we can rip the stick over have everybody reaching for their barf bags. <laughs> and mind you, we get to the same outcome. But what is more sustainable in terms of people saying that was a good ride? <laughs> That's an effective metaphor. It's a very effective metaphor. It's, and, and, and I think that, I think that um, and certainly by no means did Governor Deal take that from Governor Purdue. But I do think. But there's that, a similarity. There's a in similarity, and I, and I think that you have have men of a of a certain age, you have men of a certain background, you have men who have gone through a one party environment that was in total rule of which they participated in, and saw what can happen mm -hmm. in a one party rule environment, and are boiling down all those life experiences into their governing philosophy. Um, and I think that uh, I think that I, I think that Governor Deal's um, um, legacy, in particular, of, of, of economic development and also um, um, budget budgeting in a very conservative fashion, associated with our rainy day, because there will be a rainy day. Um, there always is. Always is. Um, but I also think if you look at Governor Deal, um, show me the Democrat that would have taken on criminal justice reform. It's one of those one of those you know only Nixon could go to China and, and, moments, and, and I think that there's that's unquestionable. When I look at the job creation, yes, absolutely paramount. But when I look at uh, the governing of our state, I think that the long the most lasting achievement will be criminal justice reform of this governor, um, as is typical of government uh, in the uh, late '80s and early '90s. Three strikes, you're out. Lock them up. Zell Miller was two strikes in '94. That, that, that's correct, and so you 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 have you have the swings, and I think that what what Governor Deal has done in a dramatic fashion is acknowledge that what we were doing was not a sustainable public policy. Right. If we were going to have any degree of budgetary predictability, if ultimately what we were doing was right by humankind, sure. Was it right by African American and minority communities? Um, and again, was it just fundamentally human right? And I think that um, I think that it is. I think that it's astounding what he's been able to accomplish. And um, I think the history books will be written by that uh, more so than anything else. You we we've, we've mentioned this several times that Sonny Perdue was a Democrat. Mm -hmm. Nathan Deal was a Democrat. Mm -hmm. Is 2018 the time when Georgia elects its first lifelong? Democrat, or excuse me, lifelong Republican. Yeah, I think that to the uh, governor's mansion. I, I think that I mean, look, I it, I don't know. Uh, I know all of them. I think all have been uh, since recorded history, at least in their lives, Republicans. I believe so. And so, yeah, no, I I think unquestionably the baton is or, or the torch is being uh, transferred from those of us that um, started in the phone booth versus those that. Um, <laughs> That, that came a little bit later to it, yes. So I guess you're, you're preparing for, for this election cycle, the coming election cycle, and I'm not, I'm not going to ask about the, the particular ins and outs because you want to avoid the, the Bo Calloway situations of the 1970s where right. you get too involved. But looking at the party organization that you inherited in 2017, how would you describe the party's 
capabilities and operations in terms of, as you're saying earlier, amplifying the party, but also helping to elect. Yeah, uh, look, I mean, they're, 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 the proof was in the pudding. I mean, um, I inherited an environment that was fundamentally broken, um, spiritually and financially. Um, there had been um, a, a, um, a breaking of our elected officials away from the party um, because in many instances the party um, was a vehicle for booing our elected, our elected officials. Okay, you, you can't have that environment and have that sustainable. And so we had a situation whereby from a financial standpoint we were embroiled in a lawsuit uh, we are still undergoing the process of, of repaying the debts associated with that process. Um, you're not going to have a healthy functioning party, particularly at a financial level, if you don't have the support of your elected officials, period. And so what, what I've had to do is go back to a, uh, an environment that I know, of which is one, again, cooperation, uh, collegiality, information sharing, you know, not reflexively just being a lap dog. That's not the role. Right. It's also not to be someone that says everything's okay when it's not. <laughs> because again, there certainly are members of the party that I love and people, again, that I construe as friends who fundamentally disagree with many of the things that Nathan Deal has done or Sonny Perdue has done or any number of the General Assembly. But my job is to say, look, do you agree with that man or woman in a fundamental majority standpoint, majority of time. And let's acknowledge that the ties that divide us or the things that divide us are certainly less though than, than those that, that, that bind us. Right. So um, the party is, is in a rebuilding environment. Um, we are um, uh, training um, on a daily basis. We are sharing data on a daily basis. We are rebuilding our coffers on a daily basis. Uh, we are doing and preparing for what a party should be responsible for, which is fundamentally get out the vote. Um, my role was to make certain that at, in November, um, the Republican base of the Georgia Republican Party uh, has, no, has no lack of knowledge as to what's going on and when. Right. And making certain that we are banking votes in early election and early voting, excuse me, we're banking votes in that environment, such that our nominees who are doing the face-to-face -face combat are the ones on television doing what's necessary to advocate the policies uh, that they want to they want to hope hopefully govern on. My role was to make certain that we look at what they're doing, we accentuate and promote their public policy initiatives, and then we're talking to our grassroots and energizing our grassroots and organizing our grassroots to make certain we turn out our base election base electorate. Maybe maybe that's what you're you're, you're touching on, but. How, how important is the state party in, 19, in the 1990s versus 2018? So sort of a post-Citizens United, mm -hmm. post-social media, uh, we're far more interconnected than we were in yes. the 1990s when you had to go to your local yes. library to, to, to read somebody's platform with the internet, yes. the advent of the internet yes. um, in the late 90s especially. How has the party changed, its approach changed, and do they still matter? Do yeah. parties still matter? Yeah, I, I think that I think that the uh, I think that is a the chapter yet is yet to be written. And it's the chapter I refuse to write in my dissertation. Yeah, it, 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 it's the chapter yet to be written. And I say that for this reason. There are components of party in an electioneering standpoint that are exclusive to party i.e. the Georgia Republican Party and the Democratic Party of Georgia are the only committees that are in statute that have the capacity to communicate and coordinate in a face-to-face -face environment right. with our nominees. Again, that is exclusively something that is um, a, 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 a legal permission or of a party. The 527s, the C4s, the C3s, the IEs, none of those have the capacity legally to sit across the table and say, what, what need we do together right. in this situation? And so because of that, there will always be a role, yes. I think the question for the future of a party is, as the electorate changes on both sides, and as we 
continue to digest and change the means of communication that we all look to, um, does a party simply become a Facebook account? Does a party um, also become a Facebook account and a checking account of which people can pour money into in the last minute and have coordinated activities that benefit them? Or is it also a place whereby people feel that they need, if you are an aspiring leader, that you work yourself up through the process of, of, of county precinct chair, county chair, district chair, state whatever? I mean, I don't know. I think that um, in many ways the challenge is um, that uh, I don't know if a background in party is really longer any, any manner of prerequisite to be elected to office. Right. And if it is determined that that prerequisite is no longer there, then I think ultimately you will see a decline in the influence of party. Well, what's, uh, what, what's next for John Watson, just getting ready for the... I am, uh, I, next for John is uh, raise all the money I can. Between, I heard the phones working Yeah, yeah I, I know, and I apologize that you're, <laughs> no. pick, you're picking up that sound oh, on, my, no, no. on my phone uh, in my pocket. Um, well, that's true, yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, what's next for me is doing what I told people. I'm going to make certain that I do everything possible to dig out of debt and leave the party in a financially viable situation. I'm going to do what I told people in terms of making certain that we are communicating with our elected officials and at the same time embracing and training and educating and working with our grassroots. Uh, at the end of the day, I'll be judged by, at some level, the elections in November. Um, and the reality is, um, you know, when you run for a role like this, that's the bet you take. Mm -hmm. And so I feel good about that process. And from there, uh, try to figure a way to put through uh, 17 and 15-year-old daughters through college. Oh, well, you know. Uh, good luck on both accounts. Thank you. Uh, thank you and thank you very much for, I, I will take up no more of your time today. Really do appreciate thank it. Thank you. On behalf of the Richard B. Russell Library at the University of Georgia, thank you very much for participating in our oral history project. Thanks for what the library does. Thank you.